it early. We are preparing the live stream. Early. Early. There we go. Yeah. We are streaming live on YouTube now. And at 11 o'clock sharp. We will start our ragged but funky presentation. It is 11 o'clock sharp. Good morning, folks. Good morning, all you Zoomers who are with us and some of you just coming on. I'm lighting, lighting a candle for us to bring us together at Community Church of Boston. Welcome everybody. We have a wonderful program for you. This is a completely virtual program. I am not at Community Church. I am in the state of Maine, Camden to be exact. I am um, in the territory that was, that is the Wanapi, Wabanaki nations. And uh, that consists of the, the Aroostook band of Mi'kmaqs, uh, the Holton band of the Maliseet, the Passamaquoddy tribe um, uh, of Indian Township, the Passamaquoddy tribe of Pleasant Point, and the Penobscot Nation. And we pay reverence and ask forgiveness for the injustices of what happened in the taking of land from the native people of, of not only Maine, but Massachusetts, where we usually come to you from a place where um, it's landfill, where underneath the fishies used to swim, but, uh, and around the borders, the, the, the Massachusetts and the Nipmuc and the, and the Wampanoag um, uh, fished and lived. Um, this is a, a candle for, uh, for wonderment, a candle for unity, a candle for, for beauty and a candle for spring. And I wanna start before, uh, before Lisa comes on with a beautiful little quatrain that I just found that I think will be a sandwich board in front of community church for the thousands of people that walk by there every day. It says, this is from, from the, the Land Institute uh, in Salina, Kansas, and it's an old English quatrain. It says, the law locks up both man and woman who steal the goose from off the common but lets the greater felon loose who steals the common from the goose. <laughs> and with that, I want to tell you that our, our musical guest this morning was, was with us last night right here in Maine. Lisa hails presently from Brunswick, Maine and came up to Camden to be with a bunch of other uh, of my favorite friends of the, uh, of the Sweet Chariot Music Festival tribe. I hope some of them join us this morning as well. Uh, and Lisa is the, the, the golden voice of, uh, of songwriting for the state of Maine. And we're just really happy uh, that, that she will join us and share uh, several songs over the course of the next um, uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, Lisa, thank you for, for being with us. And uh, the spotlight is yours. Welcome <laughs> Lisa Redford. Me. It's lovely to be here. <clears throat> Some of you may know this, it's all before me peaceful, based on a Hopi Indian prayer. <clears throat> Curtain of daybreak, it is hanging, the wind it whispers a morning grace. For the sky you will find me standing, let me live in this holy place. All before me peaceful, all behind me peaceful, under me peaceful, over me peaceful, all around me peaceful, all around me peaceful. 
In the house of freedom there are wonders. In the house of life shall I pass my days. In old age traveling there I wander. Walk with me in this holy place. All before me peaceful. All behind me peaceful. Under me peaceful. Over me peaceful. All around me peaceful. All around me peaceful. Homeward now will I make my journey where my soul's long lines are deeply traced. Homeward now shall I make my journey lo yonder this holy place all before me peaceful all behind me peaceful under me peaceful, over me peaceful, all around me peaceful, all around me peaceful. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. I was, was meditating during, during All Around Me Peaceful, trying to get past all the, all the little stresses of, of this and that around putting this, uh, this program together. Uh, just uh, welcoming several people uh, who I haven't seen in a while on the, on the Zoom and a few more people on the, on the YouTube. Um, <clears throat> I want to make a, a couple of announcements about upcoming events. Uh, maybe I'll start with the soonest one, which is this afternoon. Uh, it's a, 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 a virtual tribute. It's called Turning Silence into Song, the Music of Leon Russelson. If you folks don't know about Leon, he's a, a long-standing topical British songwriter. I get to um, sing one song in this, in this concert. Um, and also joining us will be uh, the, quite, a, a, quite a cavalcade of, of folks like Billy Bragg and Martin Carthy and Martin Simpson and Frankie Armstrong and, and quite a few others. It should be a lot of fun. It's this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And that is the, the link I, I've, I've put it into the chat if you're interested. And if, if you want to jump in after and didn't get that, that link to register, um, be in touch um, with me and I'll, and I'll send it to you. We also have a May 24th event. It's a hybrid event. It'll be a physical event at the church. You know why? Because that's my birthday. And <laughs> I'm going to have a cake down there, and uh, and also because it's two other uh, notable birthdays. It's um, Luis Guzman's birthday. He is he is my uh, one of my closest friends. He's also the the cook, and the and the um, custodian at Community Church of Boston. He was born the day after me, uh, uh, like three years before, but May 25th is his birthday. And May 26th is the birthday of Lee Underwood. Lee Underwood has spent um, about uh, 30 of the last 35 years in prison, and he is, he is free. And we are celebrating his first birthday out. And he's, uh, he's a vibrant member of community church and really just uh, rolling up his sleeves to get involved. And it's just a way to welcome Lee to, to this community and, and be of total support for, for not only him, but two other of our, our, of our 10 members behind bars who have been released in the last couple of years. And um, um, so it'll be a total celebration of that, as well as the topic at hand, which is Cuba. And um, 
we will have report backs uh, from several members of a delegation, uh, uh, among them some uh, quite young folks, and uh, uh, several other very distinguished guests will, will join us uh, virtually for this, um, this May 24th Cuba event. It's sponsored by the longstanding July 26th coalition uh, here in Boston. And it, it's also uh, sponsored by uh, Pastors for Peace, which we have a long relationship with uh, that has, has stood in solidarity with, with Cuba against the embargo. Um, and um, we're really excited about this event. Join us in person or join us virtually. There's an information in the chat about that as well. Um, so for our churchy stuff today, um, every time I come to Maine, I have to, I have to tune in to, to this, uh, this fella. His name is Rob McCall. And he, every Sunday on WERU, uh, the wonderful community uh, radio station in, in the state of Maine, uh, he, he has um, a five minute presentation that is, uh, that is uh, we call it our Maine five minute church. So um, we're going we're gonna to go to church with Reverend Rob McCall. He's retired minister of the Congregational Church of Blue Hill, Maine. And it's always a, a beautiful celebration of the cycle of seasons and the need for us to get back in tune with nature. To everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to mourn and a time to dance. From the book of Ecclesiastes, Hello everyone, I'm Rob McCall, and this is the Aonajo Almanac, devoted to feeling at home in nature and breaking down the wall of hostility between us and the rest of creation. This is the Almanac for May 20th to 27th, 2022. Um, the new apple moon coming. You never heard of the new apple moon? Well, I made it up. So here are some natural events. We're caught up in the rush of changing seasons here. So much happening so fast. Going from winter to spring around here is like going from Iceland to Ireland without ever leaving home. Animals, plants, humans all come and go with the seasons. And now they're mostly coming. We know that the Wabnaki people came to the shore during the warmer months and return to the uplands in colder months. The red paint people, so-called, did the same thousands of years before. The Hebrew children left Egypt to go to their promised land, and they found that other people already lived there. And likewise, our founders came to find others already living contentedly here. Now it's the out-of-staters coming to Maine to enjoy our beauties. That means more traffic, more noise, busier stores, and longer waiting times. So we grumble because of some innate territoriality, or maybe because we just don't like change. The cat birds returned this past week, and we noticed that the blue jays who've been here right along didn't grumble or to try to chase them away. They just moved over a little to give the cat birds some room under the feeder. Here's a field and forest report. The dandelions are going to seed and what a crop it was. Sad news for the pollinators, but glad tidings for the goldfinches who eat the dandelion seeds. How they separate the seed from its tiny parachute 
is beyond me, but maybe they eat the whole thing, seed, parachute and all. So pollinators are moving on to fruit trees, domestic and wild. Our pear trees are in bloom with apples coming right along. At the edge of the woods, you can look for shad bush, wild cherry, and beech plum coming into bloom. And soon the bees will be buzzing in the blueberry barrens. Market gardens are beginning to produce fresh greens for the table. And soon farmers markets will be opening filled with smiling faces, handmade items, and fresh local vegetables and other farm products with all the flavors and spirit of a medieval marketplace. To find a farmer's market near you, go to the main Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association at mafka.org. And here's a saltwater report. Once I set out my handmade kayak to paddle to one of the islands in the bay. And this kayak had a new skeg attached with a long piece of copper wire to keep it on a straight course in a breeze. And very soon there was a faint humming sound coming from the skeg, apparently caused by the wire vibrating. The faster the kayak moved, the louder the humming sound. Very soon after that, several dark shapes appeared swimming along near the bow as though escorting our little craft to its destination. These were harbor porpoises, shy, elusive cousins of the familiar bottlenose dolphins. They live and play in bays and estuaries all up and down the main coast. We traveled through gentle swells for some time together. And I imagined them smiling as much as I was. I never saw them again. And here's a rank opinion. Heraclitus told us long ago that change is the only constant. We can't step into the same river twice. Sometimes it seems that conservatives are the brakes and liberals the accelerators of change. If you step on the brakes and the accelerator at the same time, you'll have trouble. You'll have heat, you'll have smoke, and maybe you'll have fire. And that's when the independents get out and walk. <laughs> Finally, a couple of seed pods to carry around with you this week. First from the Tao Te Ching. When a plant is living, it's soft and tender. When it's dead, it becomes withered and dry. Hence, the hard and rigid belongs to the company of the dead. The soft and supple belongs to the company of the living. And the Monhegan proverb, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not get bent out of shape. <laughs> That's the almanac for this quarter moon, but don't take it from me. Go out and see it for yourself. Thank you, Rob Mc... Oops. Am I unmuted? Thank, yes, I am unmuted. Thank you, Rob McCall. His words of wisdom always ring true to me. Um, sometimes I even listen to it from Massachusetts when I'm not in, in this uh, territory. Um, 
He's a lovely man and a lovely ministry of some 40 years or more in Blue Hill. Um, I just I just found out that Dan the Bagel Man shares a birthday with me, and I hope uh, he will join us for, for a birthday celebration at, at Community Church. And Sandra Harris, who's one of our board members and treasurer, also has a birthday coming up. So lots of lots of people born right around right around now. Maybe it's just that my that's when I was born, and I noticed it more than other times of the year. But uh, uh, beautiful. Lisa Redfern, let me spotlight you again. And I just look forward to hearing two more songs from, from you. Go for it. Enjoy right. it, Lisa. This, is, this one's by Canadian uh, songwriter Sarah Harmer. your footsteps they already know the way on is the way out there are signs to follow there is deep in the valley I'm bound to go how deep in the valley yourself kind you got nothing to from up and she is an environmentalist as, as well as a, a wonderful songwriter all right well this is this is one i wrote a while ago to grapple with my um <laughs> my uh religious upbringing and finding spirit in my own way Sunday school wiggling on a wooden chair, picking at my dress and twirling my hair. Clicking buckles on my Mary Jane's, big questions never changed. You are holy as you are, I am holy as I am. We are holy where we sit and where we stand. What about Moses and what about Ruth? We can't be the only keepers of the truth. How could anyone really walk on water? Teacher told mom better talk to your daughter. You are holy as you are. I am holy as I am. We are holy where we sit and where we stand. In 
the slanted light at Popham Beach, questions rise on the path to the pond. And in the birches sway by the river's reach, they rest unanswered in the beyond. You are holy as you are. Big backyard sandbox feeling part of it all without my shoes and socks spirits sifting through my fingers and toes little body humming with something kids know you are holy as you are i am holy as i am we are holy where we sit and where we stand Beautiful, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. I was going through my brain trying to remember the name of of the songwriter that wrote wrote the song that's called "Everything Is Holy Now." Uh, Peter. 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 I, I'll think of it. <laughs> Everything is holy. That's uh, brought Everything that song to holy. mind, and another one uh, written by our late friend Linda Waterfall. Uh, mm. that has the line all action is worship yeah that i love i think it's from the the the, uh, the vedas or the upanishads or something like that all action is worship mm. oh thanks for that song lisa You're welcome. and um so we now have the pleasure of welcoming a new voice to uh, to community church and i want to thank ellen mass for bringing madeline holmes to our attention uh, Ellen wanted to be with us to, uh, to introduce Madeline, uh, their friends from a long time back and from peace activism and probably from Vermont where Ellen spends a bunch of summertime. Uh, but uh, she brought us, uh, Madeline, to, to our, our Zoom this morning. And, and I want to thank her. And uh, she couldn't be with us. She's with, um, with her her brother's uh, partner in a celebration in New York and was traveling this, this weekend, but she will be um, joining us on YouTube later on. Ellen, thank you for, uh, for being part of Community Church. She was president of the board back in the early 90s, as well as more recently also served on the board, as did her son, Max. Uh, so here's, here's the introduction to Madeline. Um, Madeline Holmes is author of six historical books, including Hiroshima and its six sister cities, published in January 22. As a PhD historian, she has taught at universities in England, USA, Canada, and China. Her other career as a peace activist began in the 60s when she worked as a staff member for Eugene McCarthy's presidential campaign then in the 1980s served as a secretary of the World Disarmament Campaign in Stevenage, UK. When she returned to the US in the mid 90s, 80s, she was founding board member of the Sister City Association between Cambridge, Massachusetts and Yerevan, Soviet Union. After teaching American history in Zhejiang University in China in 2005 and writing the book, Students and Teachers of the New China, she and her husband settled in Burlington, Vermont. As a member of Vermonters for a Just Peace in Israel-Palestine, she worked with Sister Miriam Ward to edit her book, Behind the Wall, Palestinians Under Occupation. Writing her new book has been a labor of love for she, has, she was able to combine her passion for historical research with her passion for peace and by interviewing peace activists in five countries. Wow, Madeline, it sounds like we have uh, five other presentations that we need to get out of you in the near future. Madeline Holmes, thank you for joining us today. And, and it's a pleasure to have you from up in Burlington, Vermont. And I'm gonna spotlight you and give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Dean, for that introduction. And I am very honored to be able to present my book, Hiroshima and its Six Sister Cities, today at Community Church of Boston. I've long heard about this place in Boston and long been uh, connected with the ideas and the speeches that have been given here since uh, for many, many generations. Unfortunately, since we are in 2022, I am not able to be at the community church in person, but am talking to you about my book um, from my living room in Burlington, Vermont. I want also to thank uh, Ellen Mass for bringing the attention uh, to the community church of my book, my new book. Um, Ellen and I go back for many, many years to the mid eighties when we um, have been friends that long, when we appropriately enough uh, led a co, um, co-led a, a, a sister city delegation to the Soviet Union. This was because of the city of Cambridge, which had twinned with the city of Yerevan in the Soviet Union as part of their peace efforts in the mid to late 1980s when the world was facing the end of the Cold War. Today, I am very happy to have the opportunity to share my book, uh, which as uh, Dean said, just came out in January, 2022. And the book is available directly from amazon.com and can be ordered sp specially uh, from your local bookstore. Um, I think I will try to put it on screen, share my screen with my slideshow. Okay, um, this is the, the book that I just published and I am going to talk about it today um, uh, with you. Um, this uh, project went on for many years and I was very pleased to be able to write about Hiroshima from a different aspect, from an aspect of their peace building activities. Hiroshima was established as a peace memorial city by the uh, government of Japan in 1949. And they have worked diligently since that time to spread the mission that they were uh, dedicated to, the mission of creating and building contacts with people all over the world to make friends, not enemies, and to bring about knowledge about the horrible impact of the nuclear bomb destru destruction uh, and to share their aims to abolish nuclear weapons. And one of the ways that uh, Hiroshima was able to uh, spread their peace message through the world is through sister city diplomacy. And um, that is what my talk and my book is about. Um, there, the first question everybody asks me is, what are these uh, six cities? Um, and I will just briefly list them, but my talk will actually be concerned with four of these sister cities. The sister cities of Hiroshima are Honolulu in the United States, Volgograd in Russia, Hanover in Germany, Chongqing in China, Daegu in South Korea, and Montreal in Canada. Um, I am going to begin this talk uh, by focusing on specific uh, ideas and specific policies that um, Hiroshima carried out. Uh, and I've called my talk Learning from Hiroshima because it involved, their, their sister city diplomacy involved not only the mayors and the politicians of the city of Hiroshima, but grassroots connections. All of us, all of the people, all of the citizens 
of Hiroshima were able, if they wanted to, to take part in the sister city diplomacy. So I am going to focus on two aspects of how they did this. Uh, two of their, I thought, uh, wonderful uh, ideas and things that we can learn uh, from Hiroshima in terms of green diplomacy and in terms of youth diplomacy. And I will uh, uh, highlight these aspects of how Hiroshima connected with the rest <clears throat> of the world or specifically with the four sister cities that I'm going to talk about today. Um, however, since this is um, a book about Hiroshima, I want to also begin by the way I began with my book, talking about the rebirth and um, the rebuilding of Hiroshima after uh, the destruction of August 6th, 1945. Hiroshima um, was subjected to complete destruction of the center of the city. And there was the fear uh, at that time uh, uh, in August, but also in the fall, that nothing would grow for 75 years. And this was a widespread fear. And this picture, which um, is on the wall at the Peace Memorial Museum in Hiroshima, shows the first sign that this was not going to be true. A can of flour uh, arose out of the rubble of the destruction of the city, giving new hope to the birth of the city. And I also want to show uh, another aspect of what happened during the uh, 10 years of rebirth uh, and reconstruction after uh, the bomb with uh, a, a picture of a museum now. This is a museum house, uh, but this is the one remaining house from uh, a project that an American uh, man called Floyd Stimoe, uh, undertook with several other Americans and of course with Japanese from Hiroshima to build houses um, in Hiroshima. He went there uh, in 1949 so affected and so depressed by what his government had done that he wanted to express his empathy but also to contribute to the rebirth of Hiroshima. And uh, this, I'm showing this city because this was uh, indicative of how many people felt that they wanted somehow to be able to share uh, in the um, rebirth and empathize with what had happened uh, in Hiroshima. And this is a, a picture of the reborn city that obviously I took uh, in 2019 when I visited, but it shows how Hiroshima was a planned green city. And it's the, it has become a model for other war-torn cities to actually learn from Hiroshima how to uh, uh, rise out of the rubble of destruction and to be born again. The first uh, sister city that um, Hiroshima established was with Honolulu. And this was in 1959. And it's obvious that this would be the choice because Hiroshima and Honolulu were both the bookends of World War II. Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, United States got involved in uh, World War II after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, the, bombing of Pearl Harbor and in Honolulu, and uh, the war ended with the bombing of um, Hiroshima with, uh, by the United States. Uh, this picture is a picture that is important for the connection between the cities of Honolulu and Hiroshima. The man, Larry Miwa, is a hibakusha who 
is a citizen and has been a citizen of the United States, but was in um, uh, Honolulu, was in Hiroshima on the uh, day of the bomb. He is representative of many people from Honolulu who are Japanese Americans who have shared their lives with Hiroshima since the 1890s when a mass migration of people from uh, Hiroshima came to Hawaii seeking employment. And Larry Miwa's family um, was one of a number of uh, Honoluluan families that transmigrated during his lifetime and during many generations of lifetimes between Hiroshima and Honolulu. As a two-year-old child, Larry Miwa was brought back to Hiroshima and lived there into, and so was 14 at the time of the bomb. As a school child, he was evac his school was evacuated to the countryside outside of the city, but he still felt the, had health problems uh, uh, affected by the bombing, but his family suffered severely from the bombing in Hiroshima. After the war um, ended and uh, into a few years later, he was able to return and has to the United States and to Honolulu and has lived his life uh, still at, when I met him at the age of 88 as a, um, a banker in Honolulu. And together with his son, Stephen, they have managed to uh, spread his experiences to, uh, from uh, suffering from uh, uh, the Hiroshima bomb to address audiences in Honolulu about the needs for this never to happen again and for the need for people to create connections between former enemy countries and with people all over the world so that we will never have this experience of um, a, a nuclear disaster, nuclear war disaster again. The other aspect that I want to um, underline uh, in uh, the relationship between Hiroshima and Honolulu is the green diplomacy. Uh, this is a picture of a tree that is still growing in uh, Hiroshima, uh, which is called a survivor tree, because there are many of these that actually uh, exist, uh, have existed after, uh, from the time of the bombing, before the time of the bombing. And what happens is that the, uh, there is a campaign led by the city of Hiroshima um, uh, rooted in the uh, botanical garden of Hiroshima that collects the seedlings from these survivor trees and sends them throughout the world to any kind of uh, garden or any city that would like to plant these trees as a reminder and as a symbol of um, the uh, horrible destruction of what happened in Hiroshima, but the hope for a more peaceful world. In Honolulu, a survivor sa uh, sapling was planted uh, of one of these from one of these survivor trees called a muku tree, and it was planted when the mayor of um, Hiroshima came with a delegation to. Um, uh, to Honolulu uh, to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the um, uh, sister city relationship. So together the mayor of Honolulu and the mayor of Hiroshima planted this muku sap sapling in one of the uh, botanical gardens in Honolulu. The second city that was established um, as a sister city with Hiroshima was Volgograd in the form of Soviet Union. And I am showing this picture because this picture shows 
Mayor Araki of Hiroshima on the right with uh, obviously greeting a, a, a young person in Volgograd. But this Mayor Araki was not actually responsible for the starting of this sister city, which began under an earlier one, uh, Setswa Yamada. He went to Volgograd in 1968 to try to um, connect and make a sister city agreement with uh, Volgograd because Volgograd, which had been called Stalingrad, had shared with the city of uh, Hiroshima total destruction in World War II. So that the mayor of Hiroshima felt that twinning would be a way for both of these cities to connect their pasts, but also a, present the need for a peaceful future. And um, he was not able to uh, cement this, um, finalize this sister city agreement until 1972, because both Russia and Japan were on opposite sides of the uh, Vietnam War. But in 1972, they became sister cities. And so this picture of Mayor Iraqi visiting is after the fact. And uh, Mayor Iraqi is, famous for, um, uh, world, for his efforts for making world peace and particularly for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And he was the man who founded the organization Mayors for Peace in 1982. And Volgograd is a member from 1983 and very active in this organization, Mayors for Peace, which uh, has uh, 8,000 mayors or 8,000 cities throughout uh, the world that have tried to bring peace through advocating the abolition of nuclear weapons. And this picture um, is also showing uh, for, uh, Mayor Araki of Hiroshima, but he is together with uh, the former mayor of Volgograd, Mayor Starovatik. And um, this, I was able to interview via uh, the internet, uh, Yuri Starovatik, who himself uh, uh, experienced the Battle of Stalingrad as a five-year-old. And he has committed himself through his whole adult life to work for peace and never again to have this kind of horrible uh, destruction that he experienced in um, Stalingrad or in, in Volgograd. And I was able to interview him on, via the internet and I was not able to visit uh, Volgograd, but I was connected because of the international relations officer in Volgograd, Maria Diva, who was able to translate from Russian to English and English to Russian for me and to arrange my interview with uh, this former mayor. Um, Maria Diva was uh, an uh, English major at the university and so was able to uh, help me in my connections between um, the uh, in writing my chapter on Volgograd. And the other thing that I would want to emphasize about the connection between Hiroshima and Volgograd has been their uh, interest in youth. And there is a, uh, one of the programs that was instituted in 2005 uh, from the city of Hiroshima was something called a youth international youth conference for peace uh, in the future. And this uh, program is an annual conference that is held not only in Hiroshima, but in some, uh, uh, some of the other sister cities that want to uh, hold this annual conference. And it brings young people ages 15 to 25 together to discuss how they can make this world a more peaceful place 
and to, of course, party and get to know each other and make friends. And this picture shows one of these uh, annual events that took place in Volgograd in 2012. In fact, in 2021, Volgograd again um, hosted this annual conference, but it was over the internet that they were able to do this. The next sister city that I want to uh, feature is Hanover, which became a sister city of um, Hiroshima in 1983. And this picture shows the mayor of uh, Hanover, who was uh, Mayor Herbert Schmalstieg, who was the mayor when the city was, uh, when the uh, sister city was established and who worked personally uh, throughout his life to create peaceful connections uh, with other places and especially with Hiroshima. He also, and the city of Hanover, has been extremely active and vice president of the uh, organization Mayors for Peace. But this picture shows um, Mayor Schmalstieg with a visiting young person from Hiroshima. And behind him, it's very, it's possibly hard to see, but is the man who was actually responsible for making this sister city with Hanover possible. His name was Toshihiko Hayashi, and he was the youth, he was the head of the youth administration or youth association in Hiroshima. And he brought young people to a Hanover for the first time in 1968 and was so amazed with the story of how Hanover's destruction mirrored the destruction of uh, Hiroshima that he vowed to make a sister city connection between these two cities. And um, this sister city relationship was based on youth exchanges um, and included things like uh, Japanese youth coming to summer camp a summer camp in uh, Hanover and to uh, uh, German young people going to Hiroshima to visit and understand the stories of uh, what happened in, uh, to, in the uh, bomb in, uh, to destroy Hiroshima. And their uh, connections were linked very strongly by musical connections. And this uh, youth leader from Hiroshima uh, actually wrote a song with the youth leader from, um, um, from Hanover. And together they uh, recorded their, and made a songbook to talk about peace between peoples. And the other aspect, that I want to uh, emphasize today in the connection between Hanover and Hiroshima is the green diplomacy. The garden that you see on the screen was a is a Baroque garden uh, that is extremely famous in Hanover and is a, a site for all sorts of uh, events and of course for uh, visitors. And Hiroshima, uh, Hanover, made a replica garden for Hiroshima. And at the same time, the Japanese, uh, Hiroshima uh, built a tea garden, a Japanese tea garden in the municipal park in, um, in Hanover. So that their connections, not only through youth and not only through peace activities, but also through green diplomacy has been nurtured and grown through many, gener many decades. The last sister city that I wanna focus on uh, tonight, uh, today, not tonight, tomorrow, this morning, is uh, the sister city in Montreal. And I want to uh, talk about this because this is uh, 
my personal re, uh, relation to the whole sister city movement of Hiroshima. What happened uh, is that uh, I was made aware of this sister city, which was the last one established in 1998, because I'm a part-time, I had been a part-time resident of Montreal and had gone many times to the Montreal Botanical Garden. And one day I noticed in the Japanese garden, which is part of it, that the uh, city of Hiroshima had given them a peace bell. And they, there was the plaque uh, next to the peace bell within the Japanese garden said that Montreal has become a sister city of Hiroshima. And this, hap this meant that every August 6th, there is a ceremony to commemorate the bombing that's held at the Japanese garden in Montreal. And I was so surprised to learn that Montreal, which had had no involvement in war, was a sister city of Hiroshima, that I decided to explore this whole project and visit, visit and understand and research the other sister cities of, Montre of uh, Hiroshima. But this particular uh, sister city has its basis and its life uh, from the uh, botanical garden. And it's a, a, a real example of a peace exchange through, uh, through gardens. And the man responsible for making this happen was the mayor of uh, Montreal, uh, former mayor of Montreal, Pierre Bourg, who um, visited, he had been the uh, director of the, uh, Montreal Botanical Garden and was actually the one responsible for creating, having this Japanese garden created within the Botanical Garden. And he visited Hiroshima in 1989 and was so impressed by the green city planning and the beauty of the city that he wanted to establish a connection with his own city. And so it is through Pierre Bourg that this um, city had um, this uh, connection had been established. And here's another picture of the garden at, in Montreal and the picture of the peace bell in winter. And in, in 2018, the connection was a reinforced 20 years of um, sister city relationship at um, a concert that four um, uh, musicians from the Hiroshima Symphony Orchestra uh, played together with four um, uh, participants, four, four members of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, and they commemorated through music the exchange and the friendship between these um, two cities. And music has been an extremely vibrant part of the relationship between connecting Hiroshima with uh, Montreal. And I'm going to end this um, talk with uh, the most um, famous uh, proponent of peace uh, from Hiroshima, Sadako Sasaki. She uh, is the one who was responsible for this icon of peace that we all are aware of and have been able to uh, use in our um, searching for peace uh, since her death in 1955. She was uh, a person who um, was two years old at the time of the um, uh, atomic bomb and lived her life until she was 11 years old in Hiroshima and uh, became uh, sick when she was 11 and died uh, the next year when she was 12 from leukemia. But before she died, she had tried to uh, extend her life by um, uh, crafting origami out of paper, origami 
cranes because of a Japanese legend that she had heard that if you make these cranes, if you fold these cranes, that you will have a long life that uh, uh, the, the same long life that a crane has. And she had uh, tried to do this and was not successful uh, because she succumbed to her leukemia. But the image that she um, has established for um, the, the crane, the peace crane, uh, has been something that we have been able to as a memory of her, but also as a memory of the destruction brought about by the nuclear bomb. And this particular um, picture was from the, P from the Pearl Harbor Museum, where they have uh, managed since 2012 to uh, have an exhibit on display of the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, and this is a real effort at conciliation and at connection between these two cities, uh, Hiroshima and uh, Honolulu, uh, which I um, found extremely poignant. And the, uh, the exhibit was actually brought about because the uh, brother, the existing brother of Sadako Sasaki, was uh, befriended by Clifton Daniel, who is the grandson of President Truman. And he together made this happen, this exhibit of Sadako Sasaki. So Clifton Tr Daniel had visited Hiroshima and was so overwhelmed by what has happened and what happened and how Hiroshima has rebuilt that he has worked now to be uh, a peace speaker um, in his own life. And I want to end this um, speech, it lends its speech, end this talk today with the hope that we all will take the example of Sadako Sasaki's peace cranes and try our in our own ways to connect with people, to make our own, be, uh, empower us, let me put it that way, to try to bring peace to our terribly war-torn world. Thank you, and that is, I would like to say goodbye. <laughs> I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madeline. So much, so much to talk about and, um, and share with you. I'm sure uh, several people would like to, to chime in and ask questions and, and share their own observations. But first, uh, we want to get one last song from Lisa Redfern. This is also the moment that I talk about uh, our need as a community and a congregation for your support. Uh, I have put in the chat our website, which you can use to, to help us by credit card or by PayPal, as well as the address of, of the church where you can uh, send the old fashioned paper checks. Uh, we need your help uh, to build this congregation and also to uh, catch up on a lot of deferred maintenance on our five story commercial building in Copley Square. So, um, uh, uh, be as generous as 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 you wish uh, with that suggestion. But first, let's hear from Lisa. Hey, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. I'll tell you all that I was with Lisa last night and we shared stories about childhood and it was really interesting to find out some stuff about about your different places where you grew up, Lisa. And, um, and I look forward to seeing you this summer at our, at our beloved Swans Island Sweet Chariot Music Festival. Take it away, Lisa Redfern. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, and Madeline, thank you so much. That was, that was really wonderful. Thank you. And I was thinking about 
as you were speaking of, of the cranes and how her life has, you know, gone on to have this ripple effect, it kind of flows into, into this last song, so. Beautiful, Lisa. Thank you. You're welcome. I just got to add the Community Church of Voice uh, of Boston uh, verse to that song, which goes, when tyrants tremble sick with fear and hear their death knell ringing, when friends rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? In prison cell and dungeon vile, our thoughts to them are winging. When friends by shame are undefiled, how can I keep from singing? Um, I heard that from Pete Seeger. And I also heard this from Pete Seeger. I come and stand at every door, but none can hear my silent tread. I knock and yet remain unseen for I am dead, for I am dead. I'm only seven, although I died in Hiroshima long ago. I'm seven now as I was then when children die, they do not grow. My hair was scorched by swirling flames. My eyes grew dim, my eyes grew blind. Death came and turned my bones to dust, and that was scattered by the wind. I need no fruit, I need no rice, I need no sweets, not even bread. I ask for nothing for myself, for I am dead, for I am dead. All that I ask is that for peace, you work today, you work today, so that the children of the world may live and grow and laugh and play from Pete Seeger. Madeline, this is our moment to, to share with the, with the congregation. I, I was filled with thoughts and, and things that I wanted to, to tell you about and ask you about. Um, during your talk, I went to our calendar and I penciled in Nagasaki Day. We've, we've, we've observed Nagasaki Day a number of times for two reasons. The first First is that uh, during Hiroshima Day, 
uh, we are usually still out of town uh, up in Maine and uh, haven't come back. But Nagasaki Day is right after we come back. And so we can uh, do an, an, an observance and an event. And, and I've already put it in with a question mark and have thoughts about uh, different people who might join us for, for that event. Um, and as are all events now, both physical and, um, and virtual. And um, maybe, maybe we could get you to join us. We've in the past had two or three speakers and had music and whatnot for, for that occasion. Um, I thought also about you in Burlington and another sister city uh, friendship that is Puerto Cabezas, Nicaragua. And I don't know if it's still an, an active uh, thing or if it's um, in dormancy or, or whatever, but they did beautiful work during, during the 80s, during the years of the Sandinista government. Among what they did was the publication of a book and it's a beautiful photography exhibit. And it, I don't remember the, the, um, the title, but it's in Community Church's library because I donated to the library uh, just, uh, just last week. Uh, I brought a whole bunch of photography books to add to this enormous uh, catch of photography books that we just uh, added to our library from a deceased member. Um, and it, it's, it's basically a photographic display on each page on one side is is uh, is a Puerto Cabezas um, uh, photo, and on the other side is a Burlington, Vermont photo. And it might be like the the, the alcaldía, which is the mayor's office, and all the staff in in a portrait on, in Puerto Cabezas. And the other side is the town hall from Burlington, Vermont, and all the staff from there. The next one is a barber shop in Puerto Cabezas and a barber shop in Burlington, Vermont. The next is is a beauty parlor. The next is the fire department. It's just a, a marvelous book. And I hope you get to see it sometime when you come physically and, and join us at the church. Uh, I'll, I'll show it to you if, if you don't, if you're not able to find it up in Burlington. But it's it's a marvelous thing. I also want to tell you that present in our Zoom today are several members of the Watertown El Salvador Sister City Committee, which I am a, a proud member. And we've, we've done 32, 33 years of work in, that started in the aftermath of the conflict in El Salvador. Um, and um, we're, we're sort of calling it quits. We used to promote a whole series of, of uh, coffee house events and concerts and political activism. And most of all, what we're proudest of is scholarships for students in our sister community in, in, in El Salvador. And um, I wanna shout out to, to the likes of Susan Nye and Susie Giroux, who are with us today in the, in, in the chat for that sister city endeavor. You know, sister cities can, can take all sorts of, of forms Every, everywhere from one or two people in one place to one or two people somewhere else, um, or they can be enormous projects between, uh, you know, official projects between uh, 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 potentates and powers and, and city halls and huge budgets. Brookline, Massachusetts has quite a, a huge project with a, with a village called Totalguaque in Nicaragua. So um, this is really amazing to hear about all of these um, sister, sister city projects with Hiroshima in the hopes that, that never again on the face of God's earth shall that happen again. Um, we are the only country that has dropped bombs of a nuclear kind on another country uh, for war purposes and hopefully the last. Um, so Rudiger has his hand up. Go ahead and unmute Rudiger and, and join us. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk, um, Professor Holmes. Um, I, I personally come from Germany, so uh, Hanover is quite familiar to me and I have a couple of friends there. Um, but, uh, and I want to bring our common friend um, in, in light. Uh, this is David Rosshauser, who who made a film about Hiroshima and the uh, atomic bomb, uh, Recommendable. Um, 
as a Brookline filmmaker. Uh, but I want to use a chance uh, to talk with such a high profile um, uh, diplomatic, probably diplomatic working entity like you are, uh, and ask you um, to teach us a little bit why is it necessary sometimes um, to start a war, which seems for us as a small people people here. Um, so the kind of endless wars in which the United States is involved after the Second World War, after all these experiences, if you can enlighten us a little bit, um, tell us maybe a little bit the reasoning, um, why is it sometimes necessary to, again, to start a war and not what I emphasize on to to use um, Bush's word, which is very uh, vivid to me, to dry them out. So uh, if you have an enemy, then to dry them out and to what right now uh, the Alliance uh, tries to do with Russia, but not quite successful because of my country in particular, <laughs> um, to dry Russia out. Um, so what would be the reasoning, uh, maybe to start a war or what, what is your experience, um, maybe on a high level, whatever you can say about this and of your experience as a democratic uh, country to start a war, to make peace or to try peace. I hope that th that would be the case even for United States. Thank you. Okay, um, this, your question is completely beyond me. I am not at all involved with government policies or even trying to understand government policies. I'm horrified by what my country has done and it continues to do in terms of creating uh, aggressive and um, very weapon-oriented policies. All I can say is that I was driven to write this book because I am so amazed at what Hiroshima was able to do after the war and how they have been able to try to spread a message of peace that um, I, I, I simply cannot talk about the aggression side of the, um, the uh, story. I only am a person who really has been dedicated to looking for peaceful ways for, you know, I'm, a, I'm just a citizen. And for my own self, I've been very excited by connecting through people-to-people -people diplomacy with sister cities. And as Dean mentioned, with other sister cities, it's not just Hiroshima and the cities that I talked about. But I cannot, I just cannot offer any words of wisdom about why the United States is the aggressive country it is. Thank you. Hello, Virginia. Would you like to join us? I'm going to spotlight you. Great to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid my question might be um, a little bit um, outside of what your, your realm is too, but um, I, want, I wonder what we should be doing now to reduce the threat of uh, of nuclear war, because I feel like it, it, instead of things being ratcheting down, they're ratcheting up. Um, I also am fearful, but I do not think that there is a whole lot that we as citizens can do. What we really have to do is find ways to uh, communicate with other people in other countries and with uh, countries that are considered enemies. And through sister cities, this has been a way to communicate and is also a way to learn about how other countries um, uh, exist and are, uh, are um, presenting the information about um, wars to their peoples. I've been, uh, as you have probably been um, 
involved with many, uh, listening to many webinars on uh, the recent conflicts uh, in, in the war, and especially the Ukraine war, and trying to understand what we as people, as citizens, you know, we're not policymakers, what we absolutely can contribute to uh, making, toning down the war fever, let me put it that way. And one of the speakers that I was very impressed by was a speaker that I heard from China who said that what is really the fear and the, and the problem that uh, we, we face as citizens is the information gap, that what people in other countries, enemy countries, uh, know and learn about war is so different from what we in the United States or in the West learn. And in any ways, we have to try to connect with people to make sure that this war fever and this, so the sphere of actually using nuclear weapons can be mitigated. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just also say that I'm um, a member of uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and this has been an ongoing campaign for decades and decades. Madeline, um, you mentioned uh, Clifton Daniel, grandson of Harry Truman. Um, I, I wonder if Clifton Daniel thinks like I do that his grandfather was a war criminal. And I would add to that list, Henry Kissinger, George Bush, Vladimir Putin, Barack Obama, the king of the drone. Uh, What's what's he like? Have you uh, have you had any encounter with him, or, or um, uh, it's it's like we look back on this tragedy of an event that happened at the end of a tragedy of of an of a war era, and we realize that that we can become blind uh, by by events that are that are going on and do horrible irrational things and i think back to Sacco and vanzetti in the aftermath of of the 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 scare uh the palmer raids and the the the, the red scare and and the horrific miscarriage of justice that was done there i think of of um the things that were done in the aftermath of 9-11 and and in this case the things that were done in the aftermath of World War II, things that in hindsight we shouldn't have done. Why did we why did we why did we drop a second bomb on a second city? What were we thinking? What were we thinking? It's it's um, um these are rhetorical questions that I wouldn't expect you even to have an answer to, but uh, uh, just when when we're brought back to to thinking about those two cities, uh, we we need to ask ourselves over and over, and try to see if it might inform our our future thinking. What I'd like to say is that I think that we have a real problem as peace activists to feel that we can make a difference with the decisions that are made by the leaders of our country. And when I got involved with this project, I realized the sister cities and even people to people connections are not going to solve our problems. They're not going to end the uh, abolition. They're not going to abolish nuclear weapons. They're not going to stop wars. But, and I, I do feel frustrated as you with um, our leaders taking positions that we can't possibly uh, 
agree with. You know, they're horrible, horrible decisions. But I also think that we have to realize that we are only human and we only have our own uh, capabilities to make a, make a difference. And I have felt that in my life, I cannot spend my worry or my fear trying to um, impress or uh, contact leaders, but I have to deal as a human being with other human beings. And so to me, this idea of people to people exchange is the only way that I can feel like I can make a difference in uh, making our world a more peaceful world. And as for Clifton Daniel, <clears throat> I was very impressed and I know I do not know this man at all. This was just research uh, that I was able to uh, undertake as an historian. But I was impressed that he, through his child, heard about Sadako Sasaki. This was in the late 90s. And he mobilized his family to visit Hiroshima and then was able to actually learn from the ground up, you know, from Hiroshima itself, the story of um, what happened when his grandfather dropped the bomb. And he was extremely um, moved by what he felt uh, during this visit. And so his reaction, whether, you know, obviously he's at this stage uh, so far removed from what his grandfather did, that it's not a matter of condoning or not condoning, but saying that he thinks it is important that this never happens again. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, there's a comment from, from someone in Japan, it starts with some Japanese characters, and it says, "If Japan attempts to use, in uh, to use U.S. influences and arises as a military power, no Asian countries will just sit tight and watch it happen. The U.S. will lose much more by nurturing Japan's military ambitions now." Thank you for that comment, um, uh, person on YouTube. There's uh, another person from Japan. Uh, whose, whose handle is the one man band who writes no more Hiroshima and Nagasaki, no war, peace. I'm, I'm thrilled that the, these comments came and I couldn't agree with the first comment more. Yeah. And uh, a mention of David Rothhauser, our member who made a, a film a documentary about Hiroshima. Um, and uh, who uh, an, um, a film about Article Nine in Japan, which is uh, a sort of legislative attempt to ban weapons of nuclear weapons of war. Dan says all wars for capitalists and Wall Street profits until Americans can give up their greedy ways for consumerism. Then we will continue wars for American stock options. Um, one more comment from Rudiger again. Would you like to join us, Rudiger? You have your hand up. Yeah, uh, sorry for my second comment. Um, uh, what do you want to say in addition to it? Yes, um, um, my question is, what do you think about segregation of states? Okay. Uh, um, reflecting... The okay. no, but uh, when, when it's recognized, I'll, you're going to say what oh, you want sorry. to say. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rudiger. Uh, okay. I had to, I had to yeah. mute uh, yes. Um, so my interest, uh, uh, which came up, was your connection with Montreal. Um, um, uh, I'm thinking about Catalonia, Belgium, and then also uh, the after um, uh, downfall of Soviet Union, that there were probably 12 years, no, not much war around. And what is your experience uh, and your idea when uh, big states uh, fall apart? Um, uh, so that single states could then do something, particularly in a uh, nuclear war time age, uh, that then the small states could not handle any nuclear uh, armor, armor anymore. And would be this not a part of peace on earth? Uh, 
uh, what is your idea, uh, what is your thoughts about this segregation of states? So I, I, I presume that you're talking about Quebec as uh, the uh, separatist movement in, in Quebec. And I am not, I'm not at all supportive of that as a person who is not uh, Quebecois, uh, of course. But even so, I believe that this whole uh, peace effort has to be done from the role of the country. It's the country uh, of Canada has to decide how it's going to act. And unfortunately, Canada is not the most peaceful country on, on earth. But I don't think that Quebec as a separate entity has a, a, a role to play in foreign policy. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, let's wrap up with, uh, with one more question or comment from Charlie and Karen. It's actually Karen. Okay, hi, Karen. Hello, um, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm just very curious as to why Nagasaki didn't come up at all in your presentation. Mm -hmm. I understand that you're doing the sister city, that's important, but so Nagasaki has known some sister cities in Nagasaki who suffered more of uh, devastation and I believe more people died uh, at the final count in Nagasaki. Um, as Rudiger brought up is, you know, you bombed one city, why three days later you need to wipe out another city. So I was just wondering why you didn't mention it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I thought this question would come up. I thought it was going to come up to the, uh, earlier when, we, uh, when Dean talked about Nagasaki. Um, I am not at all, uh, as trying to undermine the horribleness of what happened in Nagasaki. It's just that my whole project revolved around the sister, the city of Hiroshima, and I was able to visit the, the city of Hiroshima. And my research as an historian, I'm perhaps more narrow than um, uh, I, I should be. But it really only involved Hiroshima because I felt that, in fact, my canvas was so large in doing the uh, relationships between Hiroshima and its six sister cities that I could not take on uh, Nagasaki as well. But I am aware that Nagasaki has its own program of sister city relationships, and they probably are just as rich and also have as long a history as the ones um, that Hiroshima has a step. Has as a, step. a real quick follow up is, did you mention that, do you mention that in your book that uh, for further information about Nagasaki, these are some researchers who are doing work on no, it? No, I, this book is about Hiroshima. The only time I really mentioned Nagasaki is when uh, Hiroshima was proclaimed as a, a peace memorial city. At the same time, Nagasaki, was designated as a cultural city to uh, to memor right. memorialize the, uh, the the destruction from the bomb. But no, this book is entirely about Hiroshima. Madeline, I want to thank you for joining us today, um, and I hope. We get a chance to get a copy of your book for our library and get you to come physically sometime uh, to community church and sign it for us to to have it in our library for our archives um, and uh, it's it's really uh, wonderful again thanks to ellen mass for bringing you to our attention and uh folks uh let's go out and enjoy this at least in maine beautiful day i hope it's I hope it's not too hot in Boston because we are loving that the clouds have lifted and the sun is out here and uh, we will we will be going outside uh, before it's time to get back in the car and drive home. Uh, <clears throat> thank uh, Lisa Redfern also up here in Maine and the other Maine contingency, which is Alan and Lenny, who are with us on the call, uh, both in different parts of Maine. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. I hope you will have a wonderful week and you will make good progress and that you will seek peace. Peace, peace will.
Peace will come. Let it begin with me. We, we need, we need peace. Let it begin with me. Oh, my own life is all I can hope to control. Let my life be lived for the good of my soul. Let it bring peace, sweet peace. Peace will come and let it begin with me and us. Thanks everybody. And we'll sign out saying meeting at the building is over. Amen. Hallelujah. Make progress, do good work, and be well. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Rudiger, Susan Nye, Dorothy Weitzman, and Charlie and Karen, and Dan the Bagel Man, and Barry Warner, and Joan Livingston, and Dinah, and Dave and Judith, and Lenny, and Alan, and YH Pat. I saw you there somewhere. Thank you all, and thank you to all those who are on YouTube. I'm about to sign out yeah, the YouTuber. We just said goodbye to the YouTuber.